EA College Sports 25 is out, and we are exploring what this game means for sports gaming and real-life college football. Plus, we're taking a deeper look at the Angel City FC sale, and an MLS player broke a record just by entering a game. It's Friday, July 19th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. joined now by a freelance reporter and author of the Power Plays newsletter, Lindsay Gibbs. Welcome, Lindsay. Thanks so much for having me. Great to have you on. So Angel City FC is set to be sold to Bob Iger and Willow Bay at a valuation of $250 million. That is a record for women's sports teams of any kind. Uh, is the headline for you just that big number? Yeah, I think there are a few headlines here, but absolutely the big number. I mean, just a few years ago, women's sports teams. And actually, I think the expansion fee that they paid for Angel City FC, we're talking like below $5 million. <laughs> so the the way that valuations are uh, skyrocketing is it exceeds what my already like optimistic ex expectations were like five years ago, um, and even maybe three years ago, $250 million. I mean, that is you can't ignore that. Like that's real value. What does this number say to you about like the strength of, of the NWSL right now? I think it's really strong. I mean, I think it is important to note that this is a little bit of an outlier, right? Like they are kind of setting the pace a little bit further. Um, but it's a little bit like when we're talking about like Caitlin Clark ratings and the rest of the WNBA, right? It's like, yeah, like she's like, you know, her games are getting like really good views. But if you look at the other ratings, if you look at everything else going on, they still stand on their own as impressive as well. You know, I think that, um, you know, you're looking at in the $50 million range for the lower ends of clubs. And uh, just two years ago, when the Washington Spirit sold to Michelle Kong for or, or Kang, I actually don't know which one it is, uh, for $35 million, I mean, people were, you know, fainting on their couches, because that just seemed like such an exorbitant, exorbitant amount of money. Um, so I think it just it shows that every year the league is getting on more financially sound footing and more people. I mean, to have like the likes of a Bob Iger and uh, Willow Bay want to be a part of this, it really shows a lot of strength. I think I read they put in something like $87 million to get like the controlling share. And once again, like even for somebody as rich as they are, like that's, you know, that's not chump change. Is stability kind of, um, you know, something we can take for granted at this point? Almost. <laughs> It's so scary because, I mean, I remember when I started covering the league, it was, you know, at the end of the third season and no professional women's soccer league had ever lasted past three seasons before. So there was just this collective holding of the breath going into season four and going into season four seemed like such a milestone. But now here we are over a decade later and um, there's no signs that the league is, show is slowing down and the money that's coming in is just getting bigger and bigger. I I think that um, the rights deal, the TV rights deal, the $60 million per year deal, like that is, once again, that's real money coming in. That's real revenue making its way to the owners. And I think in a few years, they can renegotiate that and aim even bigger, as we're seeing with the WNBA deal that is just, it's looking around in the $250 million range for the WNBA deal. So I think what you're seeing is like, there is security here in women's sports. And not only is there security, it's almost the best bang for your buck like there is out there right now. Like if you want to turn $1 million into $10 million really quickly, like there are, you know, not many places you can do that. Yeah. And I'll be curious to see how the length of those media deals evolves because it is a growing league. The Same. WNBA is a growing league. And so a shorter deal makes, a, you know, maybe more sense for everyone, especially for the league, as long as they have faith in that continued growth. Um, whereas, you know, the NBA is 11 years and they don't have the the, the renegotiation clause. And you know, NWSL deals four years, you know, versus the NFL's 10 years or 11 years. Um, so, yeah, I wonder if you, after like these, after the next three or four years, if we'll see those deals, if they'll get longer or, um, you know, if, if they'll kind of keep going in these, these chunks um, anyway, it'll just be interesting to watch. 
Absolutely. But I think it's good that it is a shorter deal. I think if there's anything about the WNBA, I know we're not talking WNBA, but it's hard to separate completely. The yeah, they, they do the kind of go together in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, because we're resetting the market space place for women's sports like in real time and i think if there's anything about the wnba deal that does give people pause it's that it's 11 years like with the nba deal and like how out of date will that look very quickly whereas the nwsl is um is locked into a much shorter term deal so they can keep like reasserting their power and valuations like this are only going to help there were reports that there was some infighting within angel city <laughs> that helped lead to this sale do you have any take on what that's going to mean for the team? Like, are we expecting a, you know some kind of overhaul inside the club? That's kind of what I'm waiting to hear. It seems like there's been some unhappiness with the acting president, the president, Julie Ehrman, and, you know, Alexis Ohanian has um, been, it seems like, talking to the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal has had a lot of reporting on infighting going on between board members. You know, I do think that women's sports at the end of the day, they're sports, right? And you, they are absolutely not immune from the power struggles, from the ego um, boost, from the management differences, you know, differences of opinion, from the personality clashes that we see happen in boardrooms and especially in sports room boardrooms across, you know, the world. Um, I do think what's interesting in women's sports and what's What's tough is that when you build your brand on women empowerment and on an inclusivity, um, there becomes a bit of a backlash within the community when it comes out that maybe things aren't being run like that within in-house, right? When those values aren't being um you know, practiced by the people who are preaching them internally. And I think that's kind of the next reckoning, like we're going to see across the women's sports sphere is a little bit of this backlash because ultimately these boardrooms are being run like you see boardrooms run across the country, which isn't necessarily the model you want to follow, right? Like, can we build something new here that operates in a better way? Or are we just going to fall back on these you know, power struggles, ego struggles, management struggles that bring down businesses all the time. And I think there's real concern. I'm very curious to see like whether um, Ehrman will remain as president. I'm very curious to see how Willow Bay kind of operates um, both internally and externally, um, you know, as the kind of face and controlling partner of the club now. And I do think that changes are coming. I mean, I don't think you can read the Wall Street Journal reporting without thinking like this sale is a step in the direction, but this is not the end of the story. Lastly, Bob Iger is the CEO of Disney, which is an NWSL media partner. <laughs> Certainly some opportunity there, but also is, is there not a basic conflict of interest problem here? Yeah, I mean, there's conflicts of interest, like literally everywhere you look. And that's also nothing new in women's sports, you know, like you have, uh, if you look at who bought into the WNBA deal, um, like ownership when they sold like stake um, to investors to do a $75 million capital raise a few years ago, it's like, you know, Nike and some media partners and then some owners. And you're just kind of like, this is weird, right? Like um, how many of these things overlap? Um, I hope that it ends up being a good thing for the league and that it means that ESPN and Disney will only be more invested and more interested in the success of the league. I don't think that having these partners being having more skin in the game as far as like caring about covering this like a sports team is a bad thing, but where it, it does get obviously iffy and is you know, are they going to allow ESPN reporters to cover this team like it's a real team? Um, is Are they going to allow negative um, coverage? I mean, allow as much as, you know, anyone can allow those types of things. And, you know, are they going to get preferential treatment as far as um, television exposure and everything like that? If I was another owner in the NWSL, my antennas would be up, up, up. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be very interesting to see how this plays out. Lindsay Gibbs, really appreciate the chat. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me.
Normally, a substitution in the 85th minute in a blowout game between two teams at the bottom of the MLS standings would not be especially notable. But when Kevin Sullivan subbed in for the Philadelphia Union on Wednesday's 5-1 win over the New England Revolution, he became the youngest player to appear in a senior MLS game at the age of 14. Specifically, he was 14 and 293 days, which is important because he actually only beat the record previously held by Freddie Adu by 13 days. Sullivan already has much of his future planned out, at least compared to most other people at the age when they would normally be entering high school. He is under contract with the union until he turns 18, at which point he will head across the Atlantic to Manchester City. Sullivan's record follows shortly after that of 16-year-old Lamine Yamal, who earlier this month became the youngest player to appear in a Euros final. Soccer is taking the idea of a youth movement to a whole new level. The Seine is clean, or clean enough at least. Just ahead of the 2024 Paris Olympic Games kicking off next week, Mayor Anne Hidalgo successfully completed her swim in the city's river to confirm that the water is indeed safe for the athletes who will be using it to compete. Swimming in the Seine has been illegal for nearly a century due to pollution, dangerous bacteria, and various projects dedicated to cleaning up the mess that date back to the 1990s. In the past nine years, the French have invested $1.5 billion into cleanup efforts to expedite the process and ensure the river would be ready to go for the 2024 Summer Games. Mayor Hidalgo had initially planned to take her swim on June 23rd, but testing at the time revealed dangerous levels of E. coli and other bacteria in the water, postponing her demonstration to just days before the start of the Games. Although events like canoeing have been taking place in the river for the past 20 years, Olympic athletes can now hopefully feel more confident in the safety of the river as they gear up for their events over the next three weeks. Just when you thought life couldn't get better for the New York Knicks, here comes free burritos. Just weeks ago, the Nova Knicks were completed by adding Mikhail Bridges from the Brooklyn Nets. Bridges is famously a lover of Chipotle and has gone on the record saying he's eaten the fast food chain every day for the past 10 years. It's clearly working for him as he appeared in all 82 games this past season and has been known for his durability in the league. But if there's one person who loves Chipotle as much as Bridges, it's new teammate and friend of the show, Josh Hart. Things got a little spicy when Hart tweeted out a picture of his burrito accompanied with a note from the Mexican food chain that read, Josh, now you and Mikhail can finally settle the biggest off-court debate. Who's the biggest Chipotle fan? P.S. We think it's you, but don't tell Mikhail. Next to that note sat a burrito card good for one free meal per day. But there are levels to this. Mikhail has had his own card since 2020. Nonetheless, Manhattan Chipotle's better gear up for this duo to be in the same borough next season as they begin this epic burrito battle. Up next, the public release of EA College Football 25 is not just significant for the gaming world, it is a big moment for college football itself. I spoke to Matt Brown of the Extra Points newsletter about why this game is more than a game. That conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by Matt Brown, publisher of the Extra Points newsletter. Welcome, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yes, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, so, College Football 25 is being released, um, and it's a video game. Uh, but this this feels like much more than a video game. If you are a college football fan, or you know, someone who is somehow connected to this world, what what do you? How would you describe the relationship between you know college football, the actual sport on the field, and this game? Yeah, you're right. This is a very different release and build up to a sports game. It's, it's, it's something a little, you know, not the same scale, but maybe closer to a Grand Theft Auto or a major AAA, you know, action RPG kind of title. Because, you know, sports games, they come out every year. They're predictable. They don't normally change all that much. This game hasn't come out in a decade. So you have a, a sense of nostalgia uh, for people that were, you know, have missed it and are now in the uh, as well as, a chance here for the, the collegiate space to re-enter video games and reach out to audiences that primarily interface with the sport and those brands through games. You know, a major concern for most college programs at this point is how do I reach Gen Z? How do I reach younger millennials? How do I reach people under 30 who are not buying season tickets or participating as, as student uh, as student ticket holders in the same way? And they spend a lot of money on, on marketing plans to reach these folks and the video game is a way where they don't not only do they not have to spend any money, they get paid some money to, to then to, to have you to complete audience attention uh, for, for these individuals. So you're going to see lots of schools use this as a way to advertise what makes their brand and their tradition, their stadium unique. It's a way to 
to, to communicate and to reach out to their own super fans who want to experience what makes their their entity so interesting in, in this new format. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. If you see over the next couple of weeks, you know, schools like Florida International or Akron or, or Kennesaw State, you know, cut videos that are explicitly reaching out to video game fans because they recognize there could be a whole bunch of people who are going to be starting dynasties in schools they don't know about. It's like, listen, at Kennesaw here, we're happy to have you. Let me show you why you need to be spending the next 20 hours of your life building a video game with Kennesaw State because that's what people typically do. Could you answer the very basic question of why this game is such a big deal? I mean, it's, you know, at the time we're recording, it's not even out yet, uh, but yeah. we've been hearing about it for months. And of course, there is that that decade long gap, but y you don't hear this kind of buzz and excitement around almost any other game. So, yeah, if you could just speak to why this is so big. It's it's. Uh... I legitimately think a more complicated question and, and multifaceted. Part of it is because college football is very popular in this country um, in, in general, right? Uh, if we didn't have a baseball game for a decade and it came back, there, there, there would be some buzz around this. But, but broadcast-wise, college football is, tends to be very popular and in some parts of the country has cultural cachet above that of professional sports. So this would be big because Alabama and Ohio State and Texas football are big. The nostalgia factor is not something to ignore, I, I think, right? G given that this game went away in 2013, 2014, many of the people who spent a lot of their high school, college, and early 20s playing this game are now the kinds of people that are, are, are the, the run media outlets, that are, that, are, that are leading voices, that are leading the conversation around this world, and they miss it. You know, so there, there's, there's, there's the, the, I think, major influencers or, or, or conversation leaders that have a, a nostalgia component that are driving some of this. And I would consider you know, myself part of that group, I think as well. Um, the last time this game came out, it sold you know, over a million copies. Um, they, they, these were commercially successful games and college football in general has become a bigger thing over the last couple of years. So when you add that to the fact that the video game console market has matured, uh, we don't have the same, uh, you know, the, limitations on people being able to buy PlayStation 5s or new Xboxes that might have happened a couple of years ago. You add all that up together and the fact that it's the middle of the off season for college football and you build something that's going to build a lot of consumer, I mean, a lot of interest and not just from consumers. It's something that this is a major story in sports business for the universities. It's a major uh, story in sports business in the NIL world and in the group licensing world and in the video game industry itself. Because there's a whole bunch of other college sports. There's a whole bunch of other directions this market could go, depending on how this product performs. One name that's not in here is NCAA. It's just college football 25. Um, you know, similar story with with FIFA. Now, um, you know, that, that, that name was dropped too. So yeah, what's the significance of NCAA not being in the title? Yeah, it's definitely something that happened on purpose. And since the NCAA doesn't actually run big time college football, uh, which is, I think, something that consumers sometimes forget, it's, uh, I think, yeah, realized that that's not really an entity worth spending a lot of money on licensing, especially because that comes with creative with restrictions on, on how you can use that licensing during the game. And by moving to something different, similar to FIFA and, and, and EA Sports FC, it also allows you to, to essentially rebrand your IP and create something different, which was, which was something that my conversations with developers uh, have mentioned multiple times over the last couple of months. It's like, yeah, this is a college football game and we used to make college football games, but it's also a chance for us to reinvent and redefine this franchise. And that's easier to do if it has a different name. Um, so you're, you're not necessarily tied to the same decades plus of inertia uh, that you were if you, if you shared the same name. This is, because this is a game that still uses university IP and bowl IP and lots of other IP, you're not going to have a mode where it's like press A to commit white collar recruiting fraud, uh, you know, or, or 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 do things right that would that would uh, that would that would anger university licensees. So you don't get a ton more credit uh, flexibility when you do it at the NCAA. But it's a chance to kind of turn the page and create something different, which I think consumers will see happened in this game. Uh, we were talking briefly just before we hit record. Um, about how this could also grow college football internationally. And I feel like that's, you know, the, the massive untapped territory for college sports in the U.S. generally, because it just does feel like a more insular U.S. thing. It's often like literally like geographically more in the country, but also it's brands and names that um, 
you know, you're you're aware of probably if you are someone from the US. Um, but yeah, does is someone in England or China, you know, going to get all excited about, you know, like, yeah, an Alabama football game. And this is something that I think college football specifically as an entity has just barely begun to dip their toes into. And I understand why, because that it requires you to plant seeds that won't grow for several years. And there's an impetus to find revenue and attention now. It's not like the NFL or the NBA where you can throw resources at something knowing that it might not blow up for a little while. But here, I think college football can kind of draft off the NFL a little bit, where they've clearly spent a lot of time and effort in trying to make professional football more accessible internationally. Um, there's a lot of fans of football, American football, in Mexico. Mexico has college football. Um, they have, they've occasionally played American teams. There's there's a lot of NFL fans there, and you can go and they, when they play where they play a game in Mexico, it sells out. You're going to have the Eagles play in Brazil, where my family lives, and where you can get NFL games on cable television. And they're, they're it's they're not it's not as popular as soccer or even as volleyball necessarily, but those fans exist. But right now, very few places have the capacity to to be able to watch college football or college sports generally. It's not on typical television packages. It's not, it's, it's, it's not always easy to stream. You're basically only appealing to uh, the audience of American expats and, and people that know how to use a VPN. Um, and that's not something that's going to change immediately. But in a world now where you don't have region locked games and people can go buy something on the PlayStation store anywhere in the world, you're going to have a generation of people especially if this game goes on sale, you know, later on, who's we can be exposed to college football that through this game that weren't before. Um, and that's an opportunity that I think the college football playoff universities that are constantly looking for international enrollment, everyone that's looking under nickel, the couches for nickels and dimes for new revenue. I, I think, I think should embrace, I've had a chance to interview several fans in Europe and South America who are very excited about this game. And uh, I think it speaks to how EA really has a leadership position and growing the sport of American football generally, uh, you'll find that this game is part of those those efforts as well. As this game comes out and people are playing it and buying it, what are you going to be watching for in terms of you know assessing its impact and its place in the the college football world? I, I there was there's an, another th component to this I think which came up in my interviews in, in writing about the internationalization the potential of college football is that in many ways culturally college football is more familiar to many fans in Western Europe and in South America because culturally it more closely resembles their, the, their club system. You know, typically in the United States, you become a fan of a college football team because you went to that school, because you grew up in the vicinity of that school, um, or because you share some kind of affinity with what that program represents, right? There's a lot of people who don't live in Northern Indiana who became fans of Notre Dame because it's the Catholic school, um, or mm -hmm. this is the school for, uh, that 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 championed uh, you know Eastern European immigrants or or, or or Irish immigrants, right? So the it was it's funny to think about this now for a school that cost so much money, but like that was the that was a working class team for a while, mm -hmm. and that's part of why many people latch on to their particular club in Argentina or Brazil and England, rather than like, I just grew up in this neighborhood. It was I I was a part of this club. This is the this is the communist club. <laughs> this is the labor union club. This is the club that's tied to the royal family. You know, and, and there's a lot of that here. So I think once you learn how to tell that story to people in Europe and, and, and elsewhere, I think you're going to find a lot of people go, oh, that makes sense. Like, that's why that's, yeah. that's part of how I'm engaged with, with, with sports anyway. It's a it's a different emotional story than it is for the NFL or, or the NBA. So you, I think there's already enough people that like football. It's just a question of how to explain that football in a language that's not terrible as inaccessible. And not that the video game's a panacea to, to fixing all those problems, but I think it can play a part. Matt Brown, really enjoyed the chat. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend, tell a colleague, throw them a link to an episode you enjoyed. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. We will see you on Monday.